I know you're still all excited about the election that happened two weeks ago <laughs> with a 7.5% turnout. Or there's a little bit of a debate up, up here about that, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, we have three guests who've been involved in politics or analyzing politics for quite a while. Uh, it's our, my pleasure to introduce each one of them. First, right next to me is Mr. Curran Price. He is the uh, state legislator. He represents uh, us here at Loyola Marymount University all the way to Inglewood in the State Assembly. It's the 51st District and he got elected for the first time in November and was sworn in in December. And so it's been three months, so we're going to ask him what's he done for us in three months. <laughs> uh, before that, he was a, a council member in Inglewood, and which means he has a lot of uh, practical experience about local politics, and one of the classes is all about local politics. And uh, one of the things, one of the major trends that we've seen lately in terms of state legislature, especially in California, is the amount of local elected officials who are now being elected uh, before, and I think a large part is caused by term limits, uh, and whereas before we used to have a lot of former staffers. So Mr. Curran Price, a uh, very significant uh, individual in the state of California with, with uh, as you all know, the budget of California is over $100 billion, and he'll be voting on his first budget sometime in, in June, and hopefully they'll, he'll throw something in there for Loyola Marymount. <laughs> uh, next to us is uh, Tamar Galatson. She is currently a deputy city attorney, so watch what you say. I th can you arrest people on the spot if they don't vote? <laughs> I'll show you later. <laughs> <laughs> she, I know she carries a badge. Um, she is, uh, lives up in the uh, northern part of the city in the valley, and for some unknown reason, and I'm, one of the first questions I'm going to ask her, she decided to run for school board. And she, uh, this is the largest, the LA Unified is the second largest school district in the nation. But the electoral districts are the largest educational electoral districts in the nation um, by far. I think they're bigger than congressional districts. Uh, they are bigger than some states by themselves yes. in terms of the number of the people that, that live in them. So when you uh, are in that position, you are representing a lot of people. She was a candidate in the election was this past uh, Tuesday, a week ago Tuesday. She was the front runner, but she didn't get 50%. So that means that she will be in a runoff election on May 15th, uh, on uh, Tuesday, okay? Uh, next to her, and we're going to start with this individual, is uh, Dr. Professor Matt Barreto from the University of Washington. And he uh, re recently received his PhD from the University of California, Irvine. But more uh, important and, and really impressive is that he worked for the last uh, three or four years at the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. That's his <laughs> real uh, uh, claim to fame, uh, helping us design all kinds of different uh, research and analyze all kinds of different research. So, uh, Matt, let's start uh, talk with you. And, you know, basically the theme here is uh, about American democracy, the, um, the Lo Los Angeles and California experience, because we, we have both a state representative and a local uh, uh, soon to be representative is my guess, and we want to talk about that. But Matt, why don't you uh, give us a, a, a little bit of data that we can sure. have uh, both Tamar and Curran really respond to uh, and some very general information that we have. Okay, thanks Fernando. And uh, as you said, I have uh, brought with me here today a couple of uh, data points. It's very difficult, as most of you know, um, interacting with your college professors all the time to, you know, get college professors to get away from, oh, let me show you some cool bar charts and stuff like that. So here I have some cool bar charts, and so I hope uh, that some of them are interesting, just to maybe start and uh, spark a conversation that we can talk about in terms of how do we mobilize people um, electorally, how do we get them involved, and what are some of the trends, and what are some of the new things that I'm looking at or looking for um, in electoral politics and participation. So the first thing I was going to start with here is just the turnout rates in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and the, the charts go from 97 to the election that we just had in 2007, so the last 10 years. And uh, the first thing that we probably know and notice is that there are some charts that are much, much taller, and those are the years that we have mayoral elections. So when the entire city is up voting for a contest, more people are involved, more people get excited. Um, those turnout rates are somewhere between 25 and 35 percent. That means of the people who are registered voters, about 25 to 35 percent are voting in the mayor's elections. Then the charts that are a little bit smaller here, 99, 2003, 2007, these are the midterm elections when only city council members are up. 
um, and only half of the city council was up at a time. So for half of the city in 2003 and in 2007, they have virtually nothing on their ballot. There might be a community college election or perhaps a school board election or perhaps a, a citywide measure. Um, but because some of those are districted as well, um, it's possible that there's very, very little of interest. And so some people have very little incentive. And you can see that these rates went from only 18, 13, to only 7.5% citywide of all of the voters in the entire city of Los Angeles who are registered actually went two weeks ago in this election. Fernando talked about it and, and voted. Um, so it could be um, that there's been this big decrease in participation. So another question that I've been shooting around with Fernando and talking about, well, hasn't there been some recent mobilization? Um, and so if we can get the next slide, Sal. Okay, one more. Um, so what I looked at here um, are a couple of districts, and I put the uh, 51st Assembly District up here as well so that we could take a look at that one, um, is we know in 2006 there was a big increase in voter participation in this last election when the Republicans got swept out of office. A lot of more people were participating. Across the board, every district, there was more participation. But if you look at these two districts over here on the left, this is Linda Sanchez's district and uh, Lucille Royball Allard's district, heavily Latino districts, majority Latino population, and the figures there are among registered voters, the percent of registered voters that are Latino in those districts. Um, the increase in participation was over 15% higher than it was the last time there was a similar election, the 2002 election. That's a pretty significant increase, and usually we don't see those increases in those sorts of heavily immigrant districts. And there was a lot of mobilization. People were getting mobilized around the immigration issue. You know, we had the large rallies in Los Angeles, other cities. And so in comparison, Sherman's district, or even if we looked at this area, if we looked at an assembly district, this district had uh, more modest increases. So there was something to this mobilization um, that was happening around lenses of ethnicity and immigration, and that's something that's uh, I think a, a new path or a future way of mobilizing people and getting people involved in politics. Okay, next slide. Um, the, the last two things I wanted to share with you and talk about and hope that the uh, elected and soon to be elected officials can talk to us about and share with us is that this is a new trend. Um, we saw the other trend that voter participation is slightly decreasing in city elections. Um, is that the way that ballots are cast, this is the percentage of the ballots cast just in the city of Los Angeles by mail. Okay, and the important thing for college students to remember is that every one of you, if you're over the age of 18 and are citizens, should be casting your ballots by mail. Lots of people come to college and say, oh, well, I'm not in my district anymore. I'm registered over here. Um, you can sign up and vote by mail. And you can see that um, in this last election in 2007, that 46% of people in the city of Los Angeles voted by mail. They did not go and vote in the traditional way in their polling place. And if we look at the next slide for the state of California as a whole, um, going starting in 1992 and going all the way through 2006, this is the percentage of people in the state of California that don't go and vote in their polling place, they send their ballot in by mail. Because in California, there are very liberal, laid back laws about how you become an absentee voter. You just say, hey, I want an absentee ballot, they'll always send one to your house. Um, and so this is something that's really challenging. How do we uh, contact voters? How do we interact with voters uh, in this new sort of dynamic of an electoral system in which all of the ballots are getting cast? Or a majority, or not quite a majority, but soon to be. In the state of Oregon, or the state of Washington, in the northwest where I'm from, um, you're, you're not from there. You all know. elections, um, that's, that's my home territory now, all elections are, are done by mail. We just had an election on Tuesday, two days ago. No polling places, no precincts. Everyone gets a ballot in the mail, you fill it out and you send it back in. So this kind of trend is, is California is at about 30, 40%, Oregon is 100%, Washington is 100%. Um, what does that mean for democracy participation? And I'll just leave you with some final uh, comments here on the last slide um, as to what are some new methods of mobilization. Next slide, there you go. Um, so I put just a couple of things. These are things that I want to think about that I'm looking at when I think about mobilization, participation in elections, what happens. First is issues, particularly for this crowd in this audience. Uh, do the voters, especially young voters, do they feel that the issues are being discussed in elections? And that's something certainly. Perhaps when we see an election with only 20% participation, 30%, 18% participation, the issues in the election just aren't resonating with us. We don't think, well, it's not that important. Why aren't we participating? Um, what about some new methods of mobilization? So not just new issues, but what about the internet? Um, can, you can get on information online. You can campaign online. Are the campaigns doing this? Do they have a website? Are they reaching out to voters? Are they sending mass emails to their contributors? 
Maybe in the future we might vote online. Okay, these are all sorts of ways that we might be able to reach out new methods and modes of mobilization. Um, Mail-in absentee voting, as I said. This is something definitely wave of the future. Some states have already, and cities have already fully transitioned so that all elections are cast using the U.S. mail service. Um, and then the final two points I put here about the growing sort of diversity in demographics. Minority voters. Do minority voters make a different connection to politics? Do they energize the electorate? Do they bring up new issues and talk about differences of their own personal backgrounds that maybe make a connection to voters? We know that there was a connection with the immigration rally. Something happened. There was an increase in turnout participation, especially in these majority Latino districts. Um, and so that's something I think we should look at, especially as the 2008 election rolls around. And we have three very interesting, diverse presidential candidates. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Hopefully we can yeah. come back to this discussion. And I'd love to hear the remarks of, uh, of the uh, other two panelists. OK, so three points. Turnout is low and getting lower. The, there was an increase in turnout in 06 compared to 02 overall, but it was even higher in districts that were more Latino, more immigrant. So there was an impact from the march from the mar the marches that occurred in March. Is your theory on that? I th yeah, I think that could be that could be accounting for part of it. We'd have to really drill down and look at some other factors other than district aggregate analysis. But it would, you know, the general expectation would be those heavily Latino districts would usually be lagging, lower participation, not higher participation. And, and in 06, they actually had much higher participation than some of these other areas. And then three, vote by mail. That the traditional, maybe it is passe that the traditional thing of going and voting on election day is no longer relevant, that we need to vote either via the internet, touch tone on the, uh, when you can go to the voter register or by mail. So those, those are the three points. And then also the method, uh, the different methods in terms of getting the mobilization out. Um, what, so one of the debates we were having right before we came uh, over here with my class was uh, the debate between if you had the local election that tomorrow that you just ran in and the ones that you used to run in when you were a council member, at the same time as the presidential election, the, there would be a lot more people voting. And I think in Inglewood, the local election is at the same time as the, that wasn't the last election in November? Right, the, uh, no, the, the, the Mayoral election. Only the mayoral election. Only the mayoral election. Is now, and Otherwise, so, they're off year. Oh, they're off. Well, that's yeah. even more confusing. Yeah. I mean, now we're really confused. For council. For council. Okay. So now in Inglewood, the council members run in odd years, but the mayor runs in an even year. Right. And he runs first in the uh, November, November election. There's a runoff uh, and, in January. And then if there's a runoff, there's in January. <laughs> mm. And the turnout in Inglewood for mayor last year in, in November must have been a lot higher than the runoff. Yes. Okay. Even though it was down to just two people in the in the in the, in the it's still low, higher but low. Higher. <laughs> so okay, this is really getting goofy. Okay. <laughs> and, and you can see and you can see the the, uh, the the problems in terms of trying to figure out w w what to do. So um, we're going to spend a little bit more time today right now with Tamar because she's got to leave us in about half an hour. Okay, because she's got to. Uh, well, I don't know what she's got to go do. But is this you right here? That's someone reading about me. Oh, okay, because this is a hit piece against her. No, it says, that one we did. Oh, you did? <laughs> okay, I'm it's really funny. confused. I, I, didn't get the, I didn't get the some, joke. I brought some here, mail. Here, why don't you talk about it, since I obviously don't get it. <laughs> I have to see. Okay, Tamar, um, what is that? We did a lot of mail in the race. and uh, So how much, how much money did you spend? Uh, um, Spent on my behalf was over a million dollars. And how many people voted for you? The turnout. Um, we got 44% of the vote. Um, and how many actual voters is that? Like 4,000 or something. We so 4, spent about, was about uh, $90 per vote. Okay, so couldn't we just give money to people and say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a non. So, Here's 85 bucks. It's yeah, a non yeah. Go vote. Uh, it's a non-presidential year. You can do lots of creative things, but uh, paying pe people for voting, I'm not really sure. Wow. So, so you, okay. So, um, there was a lot of mail. We were on TV. Uh, we were up on the internet. We did mass emailings. I'm sure Fernando, you got emails from oh, our okay. campaign at least once a, a week. And I um, used to email back my checks in the mail. Every week he did. No. Okay. Um, so we tried a lot of different ways to reach voters. We, um, 
we did meet and greets out in the community. So we, we tried to, um, folks in the community offered us their house. Uh, and we, we would say, okay, you know, uh, two weeks from tomorrow, we're going to have uh, a little thing at your house from 7 to 8 p.m. And then we would send a piece of mail to every single voter in their whole precinct um, and say, if you want to meet the candidate, she'll be at, you know, Mrs. Brown's house down the, the street. Please stop by. Um, we went door to door, precinct walking. We phone banked them. Um, we mailed, we emailed, we, uh, you know, we did everything we knew how to get in touch with voters, and we still, we, in, in our race, we had about a 15% turnout after all of that. Um, so my opponent, uh, who is the incumbent school board member, um, decided to go very negative very early and made up lots of stuff about me and stories. Yeah, like, like what? What do you say about you? What's the best one? Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a really long story, but the, the best one, I'm a, a registered Democrat, um, and I've been a Democrat my whole life. The, the best one said that the same uh, people who back George W. Bush back me, um, and then talked about all of these, uh, um, you know, religious right type policies that I'm going to implement when I'm on the school board, which is literally just stuff that was made up. Um, considering in b before I became a deputy city attorney, I was a civil rights attorney at the Anti-Defamation League for six years, and those are exactly the kinds of things I worked against. Um, but there, there were all sorts of stories. There were horrible pictures of me that, that they photoshopped. Just every you know campaign tactic that you could think of was done. Um, there was one literally with me killing little children. I mean, no, I'm serious. All sorts of things. So the last piece of mail that we put out, we, we were trying to get folks' attention, um, is this one. And I have copies up here if you guys want to look at it. It's pretty funny. And it says, Tamar Gallatin kidnapped Elvis. Um, with this See, they didn't screaming. laugh. That was <laughs> And then inside, they like Elvis. yeah, they like Elvis. <laughs> inside it basically talks about um, some of the allegations uh, that my opponent made and how ludicrous they were and dishonest and deceitful. Um, and it was just kind of a humorous way to get people's attention and ask them to actually read about some of the the real stuff that was go going on. And then uh, in the back part of it, it says, "Oh no, another attack mailer." And then it says, "Tamar Gallatin caused Hurricane Katrina." Um, and, and it was just kind of our we were so fed up with this kind of this uh, that we mailed out. This, so this was, I think, one of the last one of the last pieces um, to hit from our campaign, and we just sent it out there. And we we actually got a very 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 good feedback from people who were just kind of very sick of all the the negative mail and noticed this because of the cute graphics and. Um, it's my favorite piece of mail I've ever seen. I'm going to nominate it for a Polly Award, which is like the political campaign mail of the, the year. So. so this is a real interesting one here. It's got the elephant, which of course stands for the Republican Party. And it says, who do our local Republican leaders support for school board? And of course, it's Tamar, right? And it's got, it's not her grandfather. That's uh, former mayor uh, Richard Reardon. Richard Reardon. Uh, and so you're a lifetime Democrat, and then if you really read the fine print, it says this is funded by Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. So now I'm all confused. <laughs> okay. So you got a, a, a piece that was sent to all the Republicans with a Republican on there. They, you, guys, you guys look like a family there. <laughs> and then funded by the liberal progressive mayor. So I, I'm confused. Welcome to school board politics in L.A. Um, I got the endorsement of Mayor Viragosa and former Mayor Reardon, um, along with uh, basically almost all of the elected officials in the San Fernando Valley who endorsed. Um, plus, I got all of the citywide elected officials in LA, the mayor, um, controller Laura Chick, um, city attorney Rocky Delgadillo, um, plus lots of other folks. So uh, we had Republicans and Democrats from literally uh, Whatever the political spectrum looks like in Los Angeles, we got them, um, and, and I and I was I was very happy and proud to get all of those endorsements because I saw a group of people, literally from all over the political spectrum, who all agreed that the school district was in trouble, that the the status quo was not addressing the the problems, and they wanted a change, and they they thought that I was that agent of change. So. Um, 
I still am, am very proud of those endorsements. But you know, just like any good political campaign does, you you know target your endorsements um, to the folks who you think they're going to resonate with. So. I'm sure my, my colleague over here did that as well. You know who's going to play real well with certain folks, and you do polling on it, and you just do common sense uh, stuff, and that's why you get mail that, uh, that has that kind of targeting. So to last time we met as a group, we had... So, so you sent Fernando that Republican piece? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not in the district, Matt. Thank you. Um, last time we met, we had former school board member, Mark Slavkin. And he, we asked, well, why did you stop running? And so I'm gonna ask you, why did you decide to run for school board, given that his answer was that he only get paid $24,000 a year for a job that turned into really full time. Mm -hmm. So why did you decide to run for the school board? A friend of mine said that he's gonna have bumper stickers printed that says friends don't let friends run for school board. Um, I started, I, I'm a mom, I have two little boys. My oldest uh, just turned five and he's gonna be starting kindergarten at our local elementary school in is fall. It, is, it, is this him? That is him, the little blonde kid on the left. So uh, he, <laughs> he now thinks all meetings are press conferences and he's like, do I have to smile for the, the, the camera? And it's very, very funny. Um, so. When we started to get my son ready, you know, started talking to him about kindergarten, and he's in preschool now, and we started telling him what kindergarten's gonna be like, and we went for a tour of our, our local school, and we started talking to some of our neighbors, um, none of whom are sending their kids to our local public school, which is a very good public school, um, and talking to other friends who are in the, the school. My husband and I started asking a lot of questions about our local school and about public school in general, about our local middle school, our local high school, thinking ahead and we just did not like the answers we were hearing from the, the, the school board. And I felt that there was no one on the school board who was really representing parents, who, who really knew what it was like to have children in the, the district. Um, if elected, I will be the only school board member with school-aged kids, the only school board members with a kid actually in the district. Uh, so... I said, you know, who's gonna stand up for my kids and all the other kids in the district but me? So I threw my uh, hat in the ring. Now, has anybody told you that it only pays $24,000? <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Um, it only pays $24,000 a year. It is um, technically considered a part-time job. So uh, there was a measure on the ballot, Measure L, um, along on, uh, on Tuesday there were, uh, a handful of things on the ballot, but one was a, a local measure that would um, do several things with the school board, impose term limits on the school board, impose ca campaign contribution limits, which is a totally different issue, um, which I would love to, to talk about. And then the, the third one is it would study the issue of e making the school board possibly full time and then what a, an appropriate salary would be. Um, so all of those issues are kind of still up in the air. Um, but I felt this was important enough to do. It's my kid's future, and, all the, and I really think it's an election that is about more than just electing a new school board. It's really about the future of our city, so that's why I'm doing it. <clears throat> so just one, a couple more questions, and I'm gonna ask the assembly members some questions, and then we'll open it up to some students before you take off, and then we'll re-engage the assembly member. Um, the runoff now is on May 15th, so the turnout's gonna be really low. Actually, and <coughs> if you're done choking. Um, we were talking about that today. We, we still can't get over $24,000 a I know. year. We were talking about that today I'm over at, at our yeah. campaign. Not much more, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and traditionally in the San Fernando Valley, a runoff will attract a similar level of voter turnout as the primary did. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that will be interesting. The, the, you know, the, the, the obviously big issue is it will be the only thing on the ballot but, uh, except for a runoff election for community college board, which is probably the only thing lower profile than a runoff for a school board seat. So there will be nothing on the ballot except for these two things. 
so you said that the turnout was 15 percent so that was in your district city yeah. matt's right. um percentage was for the whole city I in general right and and we had numbers that were almost a exactly that about I think 48 percent or 47 per percent of the votes cast in our election were um, by mail and you know the I think it was 52 on election day and 48 um, but something like that right around those numbers which is very interesting for strategy from here on out and you're going to spend another million bucks we're going to spend what we need to, to win and um a lot of what's the strategy in terms of a lot of mail because you expect the percentage to be the same in, in terms of the the vote by mail you don't know when people actually turn their ballots in so how do you target when to send it right and that's that's why there are political consultants who are paid the big bucks to to figure that 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 out i mean we just looked at um again my my opponent went pretty much he did one pot two positive pieces followed by six or seven hit pieces against me in a row um, and with, with a couple other things thrown in. So um, we kind of tracked, we did a lot better on election day than we did um, in the voters who voted early. Huh. So I think what that showed was his hit pieces backfired and the more they saw of what he was doing and the more they either met me or heard from me, um, they voted for me. So that is something that we're pretty confident about right. when we look at that, those numbers. So, and then tell us just a little bit about your opponent. He is the incumbent, has been on there for four years and he's supported and endorsed by the unions. Correct, the teachers union. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Mm -hmm. so why did you decide? I mean, you knew he was going to run for re-election, right? Um, we weren't sure, but we, uh, you know, I had, I had heard indications both ways um, because of some other personal issues of his. Um, so we were not sure wh whether he was going to or not, but we, we were pretty certain that the uh, teachers union would put up a candidate regardless. Assembly member, how long were you on the Inglewood City Council? I served uh, t two terms on Inglewood, Inglewood City. And, but they get paid a little bit more than twenty-four thousand. They get the uh, they well, get the like first, eighty thousand. The first or year, well, the first term I served, we made about twelve thousand. Twelve thousand, big. That's not even then, half uh, of what she was getting. There was a ballot measure that went into effect after the, after I was sworn in the second time, and the, the pay went up to about sixty. Right. So when you first ran, you, it was supposed to be a part-time job. Correct. Right. Is Correct. it a part-time job? No, not if you do it right. I mean, you know, you've got to spend time. You've got to uh, respond to constituents. You've got to be visible. You've got to be present. Mm -hmm. And I think it just depends on the kind of leadership you want to provide. And what type of, and they expect you to have another full-time job. What were you doing full-time when you first ran for the? Uh, when I first ran, I was uh, doing some consulting for a uh, business development organization. And you really soon found out that it was eating up all your time. Eating being up a all the time. Member. That's right. So, when did you decide to run for assembly? Well, uh, it was clear that the incumbent was termed out and was not going to run. And I had been approached by several. In fact, I thought about running myself years before. And so I thought it would be a good time to, to, to make it happen. Who, who ran against you? Uh, oh, do, do we even, we've forgotten their names yeah, already, right? Yeah, that, that doesn't really matter. It was a close race, but, you know. <laughs> you don't even want to mention his wanna, name just in case. Name. <laughs> <laughs> what did they do? Were they uh, uh, elected officials? In official? fact, yeah, they were uh, serving in another uh, in another city. Steve Bradford, who's a council person in Gardena. Oh, okay. Yeah. Friend of mine. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> That's what they all say, right? Yeah, yeah. we're friends. <laughs> so there was a big vote uh, last, well, politically speaking, a big vote last week where the legislature decided to move the presidential primary to um, February instead of June. So. How did you vote on that, and why was it a good idea? Well, I, I voted. Uh, I voted yes on that first in the committee, uh, the committee that I happen to chair. I chair elections and uh, apportionment, reapportionment. Well, was it your bill then? Well, it wasn't my bill, but I I was a uh, co-author on it, but totally supported it uh, for all the, the think I think the right reasons, giving uh, Californians a real opportunity to be involved in the presidential. Um, uh, campaign in ways that we have not done before. Certainly it's not unusual for candidates to come to California, uh, but they use it as an ATM stop, you know, so they'll have a nice fundraiser in Beverly Hills or in San Francisco or down in San Diego and then they're, they're gone. But uh, the fact that uh, we talked about changing the primary date, uh, in fact the governor signed it, the bill this afternoon, uh, this morning, uh, but even before that we saw evidence that it, in fact it was working because you have candidates coming out here now and staying 
having events, having activities. Uh, you know, from Barack to uh, uh, Clinton to uh, Edwards, you know, he was down in the Central Valley last week. Uh, uh, Barack has been out here several times. He's coming back, uh, I understand, uh, next week. Um, Hillary Clinton's been out here. And so it means that these candidates have to come, press the flesh, hear what our issues and concerns are about uh, immigration, about health care reform, um, about uh, more, educate, more money for schools. Uh, and so they have to be more responsive in ways they haven't. So I think it made a lot of sense. And it carried on the floor as well. And the governor said he would sign it, and he did. So how much money did you raise for your campaign? Uh, I raised about a half a million dollars. Half a million dollars. So how do you go and ask people to give you money? What's the, like, pretend you came into me and you said, hey, Asking I, for money is the most difficult of, of being an elected official, as, as you'll find out as, you, as you're learning as a candidate. Uh, you know, it's difficult. You try to uh, certainly have a broad base mm -hmm. of uh, contributors. Uh, I did. I certainly had a base of folks who knew me from my days on the city council, um, individuals, uh, businesses. Yeah, uh, but how do you ask? What's the secret? Hey, uh, if you believe in good government, if you want to uh, continue having the, the kind of uh, representative that uh, will be accessible and available, then I need your vote and I need your money. Well, you can have my vote. <laughs> and then what do you say? Yeah, then I go on to the next one. Okay. <laughs> Dialing for dollars. Yeah. Uh, when, when, and, but there's, the law is you can't raise money right now until um, 18 months before. Well, that, law, that law is not into effect. The governor is proposing that there be a, oh. a, uh, a moratorium on fundraising prior to the budget. Uh, but he announced today, of course, that he's for, half, for a quarter of a million dollars you can uh, well, have right. dinner with him and uh, be part of his advisory body and uh, be consulted on some infrequent basis. So for, if you donate a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000 to the governor, he'll let you go over to his house, right, right and have right. dinner with him and Maria. Right. Okay, now I can understand if you want to have dinner with Maria. But, but <laughs> it, so $250,000, and, and he's the guy that was saying you shouldn't be able to fundraise while you were uh, right. um, he's putting the, one the budget together. He's the talk about putting uh, controls in place, and the fundraising was obscene, and I think he's certainly as far out outpaced anything that Gray Davis did. Yeah. Uh, so to describe your district a little bit to the students. Well, uh, it covers, in fact, uh, this portion of, of uh, So Westchester. we are in your district. Yes, absolutely. Westchester, Playa Vista, uh, Inglewood, Hawthorne, Lawndale, Gardena, portion of southwest L.A., uh, and then a little part of Compton, West Compton. So it's a pretty sprawling district, approximately a quarter of a million people, um, a, a diverse uh, ethnic group and I'm uh, pleased to be there. So it's a large African-American constituency, a lot of large African-American, large, large uh, Latino con right. uh, constituency and some other. Yeah, white, Ch I mean Westchester. So yeah, um, and then uh, Playa Vista, it's a very, it's a very different, uh, how, how do you balance the very different constituencies in terms of an issue comes up, right. you know part of the district would want you to go one way mm -hmm. and the other part the other way. Well, sometimes it does require that kind of balancing. I try to always uh, keep into mind, though, what's in the greater good, what's going to benefit the public uh, in the uh, long term. And, uh, you know, when you do that and you're in touch with folks, uh, even when they don't agree with you, if they understand why you're voting the way you do, uh, they find that uh, palatable. Okay. Now, to the reason I really wanted you to come here. You are on this committee that determines how elections are run, when they occur, all the laws and everything. Mm -hmm. You saw the numbers that Professor Barreto put up there, the turnout, okay? What can we do about this? Or just, is the system too sick to be fixed, or what are the remedies? Well, no, I think it is uh, possible to fix that system, and certainly as the chair of elections, I am uh, concerned about um, increasing access, increasing participation, uh, increasing confidence uh, in the system. Mm -hmm. I think all of those are, uh, are interrelated. And I think, uh, as the professor suggested, we need to look at some new technologies as a way of, of making um, uh, the process more accessible. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, we just need to think outside the box. Certainly there's an increasing number of people voting by mail, um, an increasing number of citizens, first of all, who are declining the state, what their, what their party affiliation is, Democrat or Republican. So it suggests that they really uh, now are trying to uh, not just go down a specific party line, but consider candidates on the merits, um, on, on the positions that they take. Uh, but in terms of, again, encouraging that, uh, that participation and, uh, and um, uh, involvement, 
Uh, there have been some suggestions about uh, making high school students register, encouraging folks to be aware of the process before they can vote. I've forgotten the state. One state permits uh, uh, students to register at 16. But uh, they, they can't, they vote, can't vote until they're 18. Is that Massachusetts? Okay. So again, it's a way of encouraging students to start thinking about it and really understand the importance of it. Uh, there have been some suggestions about same-day voting, uh, again, about removing uh, the um, um, uh, barriers and requirements, making it more um, convenient uh, for individuals to vote. Uh, so I think it has to be a combination of things. Yeah, Matt? Yeah, I wanted to, uh, if we could, jump in with a question for both of uh, the, the uh, panelists, especially before Tamar has to go, and, and also a question for the assembly member. Can we do that? Yeah. Um, the question I had, and I think it relates to this discussion that we're having right now, um, for Tamar first is given, and, and I'd like to hear the reactions for, from the assembly member as well, but I think it relates more to the seat that you're looking for, is specifically how uh, is your campaign trying to um, get young people involved since it is a school board election? How do you get that percent? You know, we know overall turnout is low. If we looked at the turnout in either an assembly race or a school board race for people under the age of 25, it would be half of what the rest of the population votes at. So are you doing anything? What are you doing? How do we reach out, especially on school issues, to people? You know, I don't know how many people in your district are currently in high school that are 18 years old and could vote in this May 15th election. Are you targeting them, or are your political strategists telling you, look, they're not going to vote, don't waste your money on them? Because that's... You know, that's probably the right thing to do strategically, but what are we doing? Um, and then I'll, I'll throw a question to um, Assembly Member Price after that. Um, what sorts of things could we expect in the pipeline or might you protect us against in terms of voter ID laws? Um, Stephen Nuno and I, a, a researcher here at the center, are working on some uh, research to figure out what sort of disenfranchising effect there might be as a result of new voter ID laws. And is that something you just talked about ways that we can make it maybe more encourage people to vote, but lots of states are trying to look to ways to discourage people, putting more tough standards. Is that something you're looking out for? Is that something in the pipeline, um, either to, to make it easier or, or not? I guess I'll start. Um, on our campaign, we contacted every high school in the district, public and private, um, and we asked to come and speak to their government class, history class, econ class, uh, and some schools did not let us come in. Um, others did, and we just made a pitch. We told them about the election. Uh, we told them what was at stake, uh, and we offered them um, opportunities to volunteer on the campaign. Uh, a lot of schools have um, some sort of hours of mandatory um, civic in involvement or mandatory volunteer work, um, and we let them know that they could come work uh, on our campaign if they wanted uh, and get some of those hours. Um, and we did outreaching, you know, like those types of things. We, we tried to talk to as many high school students a as possible and talk to them. Um, we had a stack of voter registration forms in the office to make sure that those who were 18 and weren't registered or were about to turn 18, or if they went, a, a lot of the kids brought them home to their, their parents or, or other family members, older siblings, um, to, to register. So we just had every night, we probably had somewhere between 30 and 60 high school students in the office. Phone banking, stuffing envelopes, precinct walking, all sorts of volunteer stuff. Um, and that was incredibly encouraging. And, and also, you know, I got to hear firsthand from a, a lot of them what's going on at their, their schools, what was working, what wasn't working, what they, they wanted to, to see changed. So, you know, it was disappointing to us how few schools took us up on an offer. Um, we, we also contacted every, most of the schools in the entire district um, and offered to do a candidate forum or debate or something like that at the, the school for the students and the, the, the parents. Um, and almost none of them took us up on the the offer. So we tried everything that we knew how, and certainly if anyone here has I, I ideas, we'd love to hear them. Um, and if you guys want to come and volunteer <laughs> and learn how it's all done, that would be great too. Yeah, but uh, it costs you $90 for every vote. I would say that it would cost you $120 to get a 18 to 25 year old out to vote. When you do that calculation, does it make sense to target 
18 to 25 year olds like this audience. And for now, if I can just jump in, that's a real good comment because in fact, my political consultant said I should not, mm -hmm. you know, that it was a, um, a matter of, um, of utilizing resources and, 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 and the point was exactly, there's so few um, voters in that category, why, you know, spend money there, let's spend it here where you can really maximize it. Mm -hmm. Contrary to my uh, consultant's advice, though, I did uh, have an active uh, youth camp component in my campaign, um, went to the schools, uh, encourage uh, when we could get in, because frequently you can't get in. You know, sometimes it's the principal, sometimes it's the... Uh, Don't feel bad, they won't even let Antonio uh, um, mentor a uh, tagger, so it's, <laughs> it, they'll take a push. Um, and so there, the, uh, unfortunately, um, the, the schools were not as receptive as we would like them to be. Uh, government classes, uh, political science classes, sometimes history classes, even English classes, uh, you know, they'll listen. Uh, but without the real encouragement of the teacher or some incentive, you know, unless you just happen to, you know, be in a household or be around others where, you know, politics is, a, uh, is uh, something that you do, you probably, you know, are not going to attract uh, the average um, high school or even sometimes college student. Uh, but you still try. And so uh, I think having 30 to 60 kids in your campaign headquarters is phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, I think most candidates would love to have that kind of uh, labor available. Right. Uh, we didn't have those numbers. We did have uh, students who were coming in, and, and we worked with the classes. We worked with uh, organizations, groups, um, you know, fraternities, sororities, uh, boys and girls clubs, Cub Scouts sometimes even, yeah. um, and um, tried to do that outreach. Uh, since I've been in the legislature, um, I have authored uh, um, a bill that um, has not uh, just passed committee, it hasn't been approved by the legislature or signed by the governor yet, but it would increase the Cal Grant, the Cal Grant B amount. And, um, you know, we had a whole delegation of students, some from Loyola, that were up in the Capitol uh, last week uh, lobbying for that bill. Um, some of you know that uh, the Cal Grant B is a uh, financial aid program designated uh, for uh, sometimes financially challenged students. Uh, the grant uh, has not kept up with inflation. Initially, it was supposed to be about 20% of costs, books, supplies, et cetera. Uh, with the increase uh, in inflation and all, it's about 11%. And so my bill would bring it back to um, back to 20% over several years. Yeah. Yeah. And so we use that as a way of, of uh, kind of reaching out to uh, uh, the college age students. It was an issue that they could relate to mm -hmm. and got very actively involved in. Okay. And so I think that's the key, right. trying to, to identify, relate, uh, provide some connection between the issues uh, and the candidate uh, and those you're trying to reach. All right, let's get some questions for uh, Tamar just because she's going to be with us for 10 more minutes and hold off with the assembly member because we'll have him for another half hour. But before I do that, I want every student who voted either this last Tuesday or in November to raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> how many of you have ever volunteered in a campaign? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, we'll be out of school, what, in May 5th, right? So that leaves you 10 more days ten before. More days. Yeah, 10 more days if you want to uh, uh, volunteer. So let's get a question here, then one back there for uh, Tamar. Yeah, because he's going to be with us for the next half hour. Or couldn't you have kept a million bucks? <laughs> I didn't know that was an option. I could keep a million dollars. It is cute. Have you seen them? They're really cute, man. <laughs> so look, look at that. Well, four years ago, how much was spent? Do you know? Yeah, four years ago on this race, each side spent well over a million dollars. And then how about the other uh, uh, school board races that were going on? Um, this past yeah, a this week and a half ago, uh, Jonathan Williams raised probably almost $400,000 in South LA. 
uh, Marguerite Lamont got probably over four hundred thousand dollars from the, the teachers union. Um, I mean, it was at le it was about a half a million dollars per race. What's at stake here? Yeah, I mean, what's at stake here? And I referenced this be before. I mean, this is probably our last chance to fix what's wrong with LA Unified. Um, it, if we can't get some reform-minded candidates who are willing to try new new stuff, um, experiment, try to really fix what's wrong with the district, um, then we are probably looking at breakup or something else in the next 10 years, six years. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, and th this really is probably our last shot to really fix it. And I think that has really been what has mobilized people to really throw resources into this race and see it because we, th there were four of the, the seven school board seats were, were up. Um, we have a new superintendent. We have a mayor who has made education really one of the, the cornerstones of his, um, you know, uh, of his ed administration. Um, and the, the stars really are all in alignment right now for significant change in this district. And, and I really b believe that that's what this is about. If you, if you look at so many of the challenges facing Los Angeles, whether it's public safety, transportation, housing, economic development, everything comes down to we need a better public school system. And, and I really think the, the voters understand that. And, and I think that's why this race has, A, gotten a lot of attention, and B, really has a, attracted resources from all sides um, trying to, to, to really um, make a stand in this election. I think your opponent raised and spent about a million also, didn't he? Um, or more? That's an interesting question, what my opponent raised and spent, because there are uh, different rules that apply to uh, um, unions who, um, do member-to-member -member communications, for example, none of that is re reportable a as a contribution, and we know there are at least five mailings to UTLA members, plus they print in-house. Whether they only mail it in-house is another issue. Uh, and th there are all sorts of issues there, so we actually have no idea what my opponent spent. Um, so, I mean, that that's kind of a real interesting issue. I mean, the, the other thing, and then I'll shut up and answer more questions, is that when, I, when we started this, I mean, we pulled papers November 5th, um, and then we have to get, you, you need to get 500 valid signatures of registered voters in your district. That's the, the first hurdle, um, which doesn't sound hard, but it really is. Anyone who's ever done it is, uh, it's very nerve wracking. Um, and, and then kind of from there, by basically the early December, um, we started to do a little what's called message polling to kind of find out what voters in the district were, were focused on and what they thought of me or a candidate like me. And I mean, in, in early December, I had 2% name recognition in the district. And then, you know, three months later, I, I ended up with 44% of the, the, the vote. So, I mean, there is a reason why no one runs against an in incumbent, is that the only way to match your incumbent's name recognition is to put a lot of money in early um, and get your name recognition up. So that's, I, I was lucky that I was in a position to be able to do that, but those are the only folks you see running against incumbents. Yeah, let's go way in the back and then over here, John. Go ahead. It's an interesting question. Um, I don't know what my opponent's reform plan is. He, he's been there for four years, um, and I personally haven't seen anything um, that he has done that uh, is re reform-minded. Um, he's done stuff that, that I think uh, is more hurtful than anything else. Um, he, you know, he has real. He has really shown that his priorities are the downtown bureaucracy. Um, you know, there's, you know, I went to a school, I will answer your question, but let me get to it backwards. I went to a school about four weeks ago, it was at a, par uh, a parent group meeting, it wasn't a, a, a PTA, but it's like a, a PTA, and they were passing the hat around at the school because they were out of their allotment of Xerox paper for the year. 
So they were passing a, a hat around to the parents to raise money so someone can go, go to Staples and buy copy paper. And to me, that is just the perfect symbol of what is wrong with the, the district. You have kids going door to door. I'm sure many of you who went to LA Unified did that, or you have siblings who go door to door and sell gift wrap or uh, you know fudge or cheesecakes or magazine subscriptions in, in order to raise money so the school has a part-time nurse. You know, stuff like that. The the priorities of this district to me seem to be be backwards. And that's why I ran. Um, you know, what we can do to fix this district, right now, um, the district takes whatever money it needs to run its bureaucracy to pay for the downtown bureaucrats and what whatever's left goes to the, the schools and I think that's backwards and that is my main focus when I'm there is to reprioritize our spending and spend the money at the school campuses on students on teachers on supplies on what the the campus needs um, I think we, we need immediately to do an an audit of all the people who are working in non teaching jobs and find out exactly what they all do for a living and if we need all of them. Um, my guess and from what I've heard from everyone who works there is there are so many people there and no one has any idea what they actually do for a living except for walk around with a pad of paper. Um, a lot of those folks are um, classroom teachers or principals who promote it up in order to make more, more money. They're needed back in the, the classroom and that should really be our first pri priority. Um, there are issues involving the um, facilities program. A lot of you know LA Unified is in the tail end of the, larger pub the largest public works project um, in the country. Uh, there are a lot of issues still in involving some of the, the schools they're building uh, and if those locations are the best place for schools. Um, uh, there's really a lack of communication and cooperation between the district and especially the city of Los Angeles with, with regard to joint use of the, the, the property. You know, in, for, for example, instead of locking up the school campus at 4.30 after the last class, why can't Rec and Parks come in and be, be in charge of the, the field and run programs on the uh, soccer field after their school? And that's something because district's rules say you don't do that. Well, why not? Like, we need to fix that. You know, we, we need to find ways to keep the computer labs open and the, the libraries open. Um, so, I mean, th those are some, some of the things. And, and then also, one of the biggest issues, and then I'll, I'll, I'll end with this, is, is um, we can throw as much money as we want at our schools. We can pay our, our teachers, you know, $400,000 a, a year. If the students and the teachers don't feel safe on their campus, we're not gonna get higher test scores. We're still gonna have a 50% dropout rate, which is what LA Unified has right now. Um, public safety needs to be a priority for this district. We have the lowest paid school police officers in the state. Um, you know, we are probably 300 officers under what we, we need to. Um, we, there, we just need to figure out a way to address some of our public safety challenges on and around the public school campuses, work more cooperatively with the other law enforcement agencies. And it's not just LAPD. There are over 20 other cities, a lot in your area, who send their kids to LA Unified Schools and each one has its own police force and its own uh, you know, city council and that there's a lot we could and should be be doing so okay um i was going to say we have time for like three or four more questions but, but I give, too much. given her answers i think Sorry. we have time for just i'll uh, talk like really quickly <laughs> no john john your question got answered yeah. yeah cornelius and then go ahead ask your question and then before you answer let's, let me okay. get two questions i'll talk real okay. quick no unions didn't donate to her yeah i'm not the, the i'm sorry i'm not supposed to talk oh, oh yeah that's right Okay, so who were her contributors? Okay. Who ran the campaign? And who ran the campaign? Okay. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, Interesting. The answer to both of those questions kind of goes together. Um, we raise. This is a really kind of strange answer. We raised, I raised $250,000 um, in a handful of larger checks, 
but mainly $25, $100 checks from friends and colleagues and people I met and, and all, all sorts of things. And we, so we, we raised $250,000 in three and a half months. Um, we got, the, the mayor has, um, the, the mayor set up a committee called Partnership for Better Schools um, and he raised money for the partnership, and the partnership helped uh, pay for a lot of my, my mail and my entire cable buy. So that's kind of where the, the money came from. You know, the, the money that we spent on the, the campaign went for some of the mail, some of the, the walk program, um, running our day-to-day -day operations, the campaign headquarters, our, our, our campaign staff, all that type of thing. Um, my campaign was run, we have a campaign manager, um, I have a campaign consultant who I've been friends with for probably over 15 years. Who's that? Was uh, that uh, her name is Samantha Stevens. Right. Um, we have a consultant for mail, and then we, we have folks who run kind of the day-to-day -day field operation, the volunteer coordinator, kind of your, your standard uh, office type situation. With regard to what's the payoff for the union for spending this much money to keep my, my opponent in office, I mean, you would really have to ask them. It is very, very important for um, the teachers' union, they believe, to keep a someone in office who is extremely loyal to them. So you're, you, you would really have to ask them why. Yeah, but the teachers are good guys. The, the teachers are good guys, and that's why uh, I have a lot of teachers supporting me, um, but the teachers' union uh, is supporting my opponent um, and really paying for his whole campaign. I think the last report that I looked at, and please don't quote me on it, is that I think he raised about $10,000 of non-union money. The, so. the entire campaign was funded by the teachers' union. Are some of those administrative jobs that you would potentially recommend cutting are those union jobs? Are those but that's a different union. Well? Yeah, that's a different union. I mean, the so the right. answer is it, it, it's not really it. It's uh, a lot of the ad administrative jobs are not y union jobs. They they are just more kind of patronage type jobs or people who kind of move up the uh, food chain. They might have close ties. Or they might have close ties, relations, and often these are people, and this is just, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this, um, is that, you know, we've changed school board members so many times in the last, let's say, 15 years. Um, we have changed superintendents several times, but the top administrators, the, the bureaucrats have not changed. And we wonder why nothing ever changes in the school district. You know, someone has to go in there who has kind of, who, who's willing to, to say, you know what, you've been here for 23 years in this same job, um, dropout rates at 50%, you know, X, Y, and Z is happening. There's a, a, a shooting on, on or, or around campus, you know, every, every two weeks you know, you're being moved or you're fired or you can go back to the, the, the classroom. I mean, that's what this has come down to. There is a crisis here and um, we, we can't just fiddle at the edges. We are looking at kind of complete upheaval and re reform in this district um, or, you know, I'm gonna be one of the folks out there, you know, arguing for, you know, doing something different because I want my kids to get a public education here in Los Angeles and, uh, and you know the way things are are going that's going to be difficult we're worried well Tamar thank you for coming by thank let's you. give her a hand I, pro I, I have promised I'd get her out of here at 6 we're not doing so bad at 6 10 so we're, we're, we're okay so um, you know one of the big things is that the state legislature actually has tremendous impact on education you guys control almost as, uh, a lot of the money that's going to go to LA Unified mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we do, and, and uh, of course, a lot of the money is is, um, is already uh, allocated or categorized. Or, uh, but the challenge is to, um, you know, get the funds I think to the schools who really need it. And I'm not suggesting the LA Unified that doesn't need the money, uh, but I think the challenge in every district is to get the the resource to those poor performing schools to bring them up. And so, uh, frequently, it's not a matter of not having enough money, but it's how it's allocated. And, you know, I think a top-down review of, of um, 
of uh, management is certainly appropriate. Yeah, you know, Matt and I do a lot of research about, you know, if we were to only change this law, or if we only to do this, uh, you know, if we had redistricting right, if we had maybe term limits was a little bit different, if we had, uh, um, you know, uh, all kinds of, we try to tweak, but ultimately we come to the conclusion that would actually change turnout very little, you know, and but are, what are the, uh, um, laws or rules or regulations that you guys are considering or thinking about changing uh, that have come before your committee, or you, what, what are your, some of your own that, that, that you're thinking well, about? Well, you that know, you'd like as, to see? as a matter of fact, uh, so far there have been about 80 elections related bills uh, introduced in three months in the in the um, in the whole legislature. Two thirds of those are going to come out of the assembly. Um, the um, in, in the past we've heard about maybe 60 bills. I understand. Mm -hmm. But I think we'll see some major, um, uh, some major issues that we'll have to address in several areas. One is the initiative reform. There's lots of concerns about how initiatives are handled in, mm -hmm. in the state. Um, so there's a, a request, a, a interest in having greater disclosure of who's behind the initiative, who's actually funding it. Um, you know, we all want clearer language so that we know when we're voting no, it really means no, not yes, <laughs> as frequently occurs. This notion of term limits, of course, is something that the, um, the committee will, will be grappling with uh, to a point. Uh, there's, there has been uh, uh, an initiative proposed to address that issue. We'll see how, uh, how that moves forward. Um, redistricting, however, is something that the legislature traditionally has been involved in, and uh, there are um, at least one proposal to create a redistricting commi commission that would look at how the lines are drawn, taking that authority away from the legislature, which is pretty controversial, if, as you can imagine, mm -hmm. at least for, uh, right. for those uh, incumbents. And, uh, and then finally, campaign finance uh, reform, I think, is something that uh, will probably be coming out of our committee now, as well. I mean, I think these are all important issues, and I talk a lot about them in class, and, and, but ultimately, will they make that big of a difference in turnout? Well, you know, I think they all go to uh, instilling uh, confidence, instilling uh, the feeling that people feel that the system really does work. Mm -hmm. And um, while they may, you know, notch it up a little here and there, I think we're going to have to be doing some long-term um, things to encourage people to, to vote, making it easier for them to vote, and making them realize the, the real value of their, uh, of their vote. Okay. I'm going to ask you two more questions before I open it up to the students. One is on Internet voting, but before that, what is the, you've been in office since December. You got sworn in like the first week of December. Right. Then you went on vacation for like four weeks. Not just you, the whole legislature. Yeah. Well, not really uh, vacation. We had a series of workshops and seminars and briefings. I was joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> you really got back like on, uh, in January, January, the first week of January. Yeah. So January, February, March. I mean, you're still a rookie. Yes. Okay. What's been the biggest surprise to you? Uh, the biggest surprise has been just the sheer volume of, of work, the volume of things that you have to do. You know, your first uh, uh, 45 days or so are filled with what they call, with what they call meet and greets. Uh, you know, a parade of people coming through the office, 15-minute increments, telling you what they do, who they represent, why they want to be your friend uh, kind of approach. I mean, literally hundreds. You know why they want to be your friend, right? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Uh, at that same time, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, develop our bill packages. You know, sometimes you come in with an idea about a bill, uh, or someone comes to you with an idea about a bill, or, or uh, a group or an organization may have a bill suggestion. And so then there's that process. Um, and the, uh, the other thing that you are just struck by, that I am struck by, is just the sheer volume of resources, the, the money, um, the, the people, that are involved, the ideas, uh, and the, um, the bureaucracy, the system, you know, how hard it is to kind of move things along one way or the other, uh, how certainly in an era of, ter of term limits when, you know, you're there for six years or eight years, uh, you know, you sometimes pale in comparison to the uh, veteran who's been there for 15 or 20 years, the bureaucrat who's been there mm -hmm. for 15 or 20 years, who certainly has the institutional knowledge and the relationships that frequently are very important. So all those things, uh, but it still is a very uh, empowering, a very exciting, a very awesome uh, opportunity and responsibility, and I'm glad to be there. Yeah, internet voting. Uh, I think it's uh, 
something that we'll see more and uh, considered more and more. Obviously, there are issues about security. It's kind of gone through your committee, though. It will come uh, before this committee. The issues about security, uh, probably first and foremost. Uh, but I think we need to start utilizing the technology in ways we have it. Maybe we'll start permitting, you know, voting on your on the iPods and, and uh, right. kiosks. Uh, you know, you laugh now, but you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, that, that may be the way it's done. So yeah. I think we already have that fear now. So I think whatever potential fears there are about internet voting. Um, are very, very similar to what we have now. Yeah, now but it's, it's psychological, increases. though. With a, a, a mail vote, you can see it's it's uh, tangible. Mm -hmm. And you get the ballot, and you can mark it, and then you mail it, and there's a track record. No, no, no I'm not talking about the security. I'm talking about specifically he's asking about, you know, is it going to make it so that any uninformed person can just go, oh, I'll sign on today and vote, and you haven't studied the election. Yeah. Well, you can do that right now. Yeah, but our, our, very, our, very guess, our guess is going to be the following. People who vote for, by mail are actually more informed than those who go to the to the polls on Correct. a daily basis. People Correct. who vote by the internet are going to be the more informed voters, believe it or not. And so, that you were a civic participant. Mm -hmm. exactly. Hey, man, if we're willing to date via the Internet and even get married, I mean, come on, voting is hardly, you, you know. Far behind, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Yes. Random. Meaning that there are many more Democrats than Republicans. So you don't like the winner take all. You'd rather see a proportional kind of uh, right. breakout. Yeah, but why would the Democrats do that? Why would the Democrats? No, the intention is always to win. No, democracy is when the Democrats are in power. <laughs> That's the power, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, in Texas, the roles are reversed. You would have to, but would you agree? Would you agree that you would have to have a system in which all states? were structured that way, or it would significantly hurt right. the states that were. All states would have to be proportional. Right, some kind of a national standard, right. right. Now, so, you know, Gore would have benefited from that if all the states were oh, yeah. evenly separated like they are in Florida. Right. In California, I mean, you can think about the California vote and whether or not you want to help California voters, you know, become more active citizens. That's well, really you know, again, you got to remember that you, we have two entrenched parties, political parties, Democrats and Republicans, and frequently, you know, they collaborate and get together and agree that, uh, you know, the status quo is the way they want it to be. It benefits both. And uh, I think that is uh, one reason why uh, decline to states are increasing. People who just don't necessarily agree with that very hard party line and feel that there should be some, um, 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 some more give in the system. So. Any more? Yeah. Charles.
Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of that skepticism is certainly uh, warranted. The issue behind redistricting is certainly uh, brings that to the fore. Uh, again, traditionally, uh, redistricting is something that is done by the legislature. And frequently, it's a, it's a legislature that's in power and who has a governor that will sign the bill. That's what happens. What's, what's occurred in California the last several cycles, uh, well, uh, several cycles ago, uh, the Republicans uh, couldn't agree, the Democrats couldn't agree, the governor wouldn't sign the bill, and the courts had to make the decision. Well, this last time around, the Republicans agreed, the Democrats agreed, and the governor did sign the bill, and they basically agreed that there'd be a slight Democratic majority, you know, and that's, you know, the Republicans went along with it, and so that's the way it went. This notion but, of But there's something wrong with the representatives choosing their voters instead of the voters choosing the I, representatives. I, I agree, and some states have begun to look at that. And I think progressive uh, political leaders realize that, that that's flawed, and it does cause some, raises some question uh, in the eyes of, of uh, voters who, who wonder, you know, are they drawing the lines to suit themselves? I mean, you, there are all kinds of horror stories out there mm -hmm. about gerrymandering about how individuals are included in a district or excluded by a couple of blocks because they may run against you and that kind of stuff. So this idea of creating an independent body to, to take over those chores is, is really quite revolutionary and one that uh, even uh, in California is, um, uh, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of, of uncertainty about. While there have been several in the assembly, for example, uh, who have who said that they're willing to go along with that, the congressional delegation is saying no. They say, hey, wait a minute. We got control of Congress. <laughs> you know, we happen to have a speaker who, from California. We don't want anybody tinkering with these district lines. You know, we want to make sure we control it. We're not going to put that in the hand of some third party, no matter how well-meaning or well-qualified they may be. Uh, so, for example, in the deal that, uh, in a redistricting proposal that may come out of California, it's likely that it will involve the assembly the legislature, I mean, Senate and the um, Assembly, but not the congressional mm. seats, which in, traditionally it's all done as a part of one package. Mm -hmm. But they have the, Democra the, Dem uh, the uh, Democratic majority, the delegation, I should say, uh, in years past has spent a lot of money to make sure that proposals uh, that would uh, change the way the lines are drawn mm -hmm. Um, you know, lots of money has been spent, and the, you know, the, the, the rumor is that if the legislature tries to put something on the ballot, and it will have to go on the, the, um, would go on the ballot, to propose such a measure, creating a commission, that in fact the congressional delegation would raise millions and millions and millions of dollars to fight it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Charles and then Jennifer. Well, I don't know if they would. Um, I think it'd be the, just the opposite, actually. Yeah, it's interesting because you know the internet uh, has spawned just a whole another level of, of civic activism, you know, amongst those who want to be active. Right. You know, and so now it's not unusual, for example, for a legislator to get, you know, four or five hundred letters, you know, from quote constituents. I mean, it's the same letter. It's you know, it's a form letter that. Mm -hmm. every, but now all you do is just punch the button and the letter goes out. Um, so, you know, you might, uh, you might so in fact do, do see you more read, Do you read those? Yeah, you read the first two or three, and then you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is, hey, you gotta, <laughs> this you is some organized chaos here. <laughs> Make sure you, I, I'm a constituent. Make sure you read my. I will read, <laughs> I'll read yours. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer. Sure, sure thing. I think that's a good question and um, uh, something that definitely is a new uh, um, found trend on the rise across uh, all sorts of uh, different racial and ethnic groups and kind of keeping track of that. You know, I started out by saying and talking about the uh, immigration rallies and people trying to understand that and uh, 
one effort that we were involved in uh, with the Center for the Study of uh, Los Angeles and uh, some other community organizations here was the New Americans exit poll, which was an exit poll specifically of immigrant uh, voters and voters of immigrant backgrounds, or maybe their parents were, to try to specifically dial in and understand this group of voters and so what were their preferences. Say, let me just say, so if I was a student and I was going to write a paper on elections, a paper that was due, let's say, in two weeks, <laughs> and I would want to read that, wouldn't I? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Absolutely. That would, that would probably be a good resource to look at. There's a lot of uh, fascinating and, and, information and, and data. And copies of that, right? And you could probably get it from your uh, uh, local center for the study of Los Angeles oh, okay. just <laughs> on the fourth floor. Okay, I just uh, for no, no, they've already paid thirty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> <laughs> but this is certainly something that uh, the assembly member uh, is aware of with with such a diverse district. Um, and so these voters in particular, you know, we were interested to see what was going on. We all know there's been a large growth in, in uh, immigrant and minority voters, um, and so this poll helped shed some light on exactly what their issues of concern were, how important were immigration issues, immigration reform, and now even at the state issue. Um, it's something that the state is, is having to deal with and, and what and how much involvement uh, will the state have in an immigration issue, which is traditionally a federal issue. Um, and so these issues, not just candidates and voters, but as issues, as policy issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I'd like to throw it to you. How do you uh, yeah, reflect well, you on know, that as your constituents, your voters sure. being more diverse, but also as sure. policy it's, issues? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, question uh, in terms of how w the role that organizations play in encouraging Involvement traditionally, you know, NAACP, um, um, uh, the Latino organizations, uh, Asian organizations have been actively involved in registering people right. to vote, mm -hmm. encouraging that process, and uh, yet we find that uh, you know, as you said, the participation doesn't really go up that much. Um, even sometimes the registration numbers don't really go. A great deal of effort goes into it. And so, uh, you know, some of us are thinking, well, gee whiz, what can the state do to make it easier to, to, right. to register? How, right. You know, um, maybe instead there was a bill, pa a bill proposed, for example, that 18-year-olds uh, uh, be registered when they get their diploma or that they show that they're registered before they can receive their diploma. Well, gee whiz, why do we put all that pressure on students to, you know, go to the registrar's office, figure out where to go, get the paperwork, bring it back. It's got to be processed by the school, and there's some kind of a lag. More bureaucracy, like yeah. Tomorrow was talking. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, why don't why don't we permit the registration in the classroom? You know, just as a part of the your, your registration process. Why can't you register to vote at, at the same time? Or when you're, of course, uh, you know, they make those forms available when you're at the DMV and some other agencies. But what can we do to make it easier? In other words, we we fund these. Uh, these uh, voter registration groups, nonprofit organizations, go to corporations for money to then go out and try to register people. You know, is that is that the role that the corporation should be playing? You know, or should the state be be making it easily accessible, uh, available, so that people can register at least register? Uh, certainly, no way to make people be involved, but at least they're registering to do it in a way that's easier. So I don't know. I think I think there's some responsibility on both sides. I think we need to be looking at how we do things and, and how we can do them better. Um, registration is an important part of the process, uh, but we should be making it easier, making it uh, uh, certainly more meaningful, and at the same time, making it a secure process. Yeah, let me get John and then Stephen. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea. Why not? So, uh, yeah, Stephen and then. Yeah, and of course, part of the problem, of course, is that you have 50 states. Each state's got their own little twisted you right. know, rule of how it happens. So, e e rules even are different within counties in California. Sometimes they are yeah. different within counties. Stephen. Well, you know, you can't make somebody vote, but I think. How about register? I you think, can make someone I register. think you can make folks register. I oh, good. You heard it here first. It's a policy <laughs> from the chairman of the new rules. It's going to be in the Loyola next week. <laughs> you know, how you do that, it's a different question. I, I think, uh, you know, short of, you know, putting a gun or a knife to someone's back to say, okay, you didn't fill out this form, at least, at least make it a, make it easy to occur and then perhaps some slight Penalty if you don't do it or something. So the headlines, assemblymen willing to use gun to force people to register <laughs> to vote. In yeah. his district. In it his district. 
Well, I mean, to register to vote? The, you know, the original, the original, some of the original registration laws um, go back to keeping track of people to make sure they're in the right district. Right. That's um, and so there was this, uh, there was this uh, dispute, say, between Kansas and Nebraska. People from Nebraska would come over into Kansas on election day <laughs> and vote. And they would try to vote people in who would, you know, have more favorable policies towards land or farming issues and stuff like this. So they started passing more and more laws to say, well, okay, now you want to vote in this election, that's great. Uh, but you need to prove that you're this. You're, and that's why the registration law started. Well, you have to register 30 days in advance before the election. Um, so that 30 days before the election, you need to come, get on the rolls, mm -hmm. show us your address so that you're actually a resident of California. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can vote in the city of L.A.'s election for mayor is that you, you know, that you live in the city of LA. So there are these sorts yeah. of requirements, and that's why and I think the suggestion to make it easier just to become registered mm -hmm. um, is one thing. I think we do need registration law so that we can sure. make sure people are in the correct jurisdiction, that right. you're not voting in the, right. you know. Uh, but, you know, but again, using technology, maybe we don't need 30 days, maybe 10 days. Sure. I'm for six is, days. Is, uh, is, a, is an appropriate period of time now because of technology, because we can check, because we, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? So we need to try yeah. to figure out how we're doing things you know, not throwing everything out, but how can they be adapted? How can it be revised? How can we make it reformed? Again, so it's more uh, voter friendly, more likely that people will want to be in the, yeah. to there is participate. Actually, there are some states that have same day registration. Mm -hmm. And Michael talked about that, yeah. That is, that's mm -hmm. not the only way to get a list for jury duty, but that is one. It is one, yes. Yeah, so it does increase your chances for jury duty. What so a terrible uh, fate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it, uh, it, it has not been common in the past. So this is the largest group of freshmen going in. I like Maybe 38. There are about 38 of us. 38 out of the 80 are wow. freshmen. Yeah, right, which is unusual. I like to think that the speaker had confidence in my skills and my abilities, and he thought I was the best person for the job. I, I, though I will admit that when they initially uh, offered the position, I was, oh, gee, I, you know, elections. I, hey, internet <laughs> voting. <laughs> So. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm honored to have the responsibility and, uh, you know, with, uh, with my colleagues, we're making it work. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a very unfair question because I wouldn't ask this question if you were white. And the question is, are you an African-American who's an elected official or are you an elected official who just happens to be African-American? Now, I your think district. I'm, I'm, I'm an African American who's an elected official. I'm, I don't certainly deny my my ethnic or my cultural orientation. I, I respect it as I respect others, but I think it's a reality that uh, helps uh, define who I am and, and my uh, my philosophies. And it impacts how you make laws. Absolutely. In your district, is considered a black district, even though it represents part of Westchester uh, and all that politically. Well, uh, yeah, politically, even though now the uh, percent of the population right. is certainly. Uh, larger than the um, African-American registration, but, but it's considered a black seat. Yeah, yeah. The first guy, the first African-American who won that seat was uh, Curtis Tucker mm -hmm. who won in 1974, who also happened to be an Inglewood yes. city council member. I think yes. he might have even been the very first black to win uh, uh, in he, Inglewood. He was the second. Actually. Second. Yeah. Well, I got that fact from Dr. Chris Gerald, so okay. it's, <laughs> I, um, so when, when you, um, when you, what does it mean today in California? to be not a minority legislator, but an African-American legislator, mm -hmm. given the rise of Latino elected officials. Mm -hmm. Even though there was a little bit of a bump of African-Americans, they went from four to seven in the assembly this last year. Correct, election. four to seven, a total of nine, uh, because of two, two, two in the Senate. Senate. Right. So of 180, there are approximately, well, there are nine African-Americans, and I think, uh, how many? Um, Latinos? Latinos? Oh, we lost like count, man, there's a lot of them. 30 something. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, but, I mean, it's but there's a, still a lot more white guys too, and and a lot more. Well, you know, the, the, our our legislature is a lot more diverse than it has ever been, in terms of of uh, minorities, 
course. Of course, we're not really the majority. The, minor the yeah, minorities who, who, are the majority now. Who's the minority now? Who's the majority? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in terms of women in leadership positions, in terms of uh, well, uh, African American yeah. chairs, Latino chairs, uh, the the speaker is Latino. The speaker is Latino. The previous uh, speaker was African American. Yeah. So there's been a great deal of diversity in the California legislature that reflects California, and uh, we certainly want to make sure that that diversity uh, remains. Um, uh, as it is, and and that uh, uh, seats, uh, that certainly is a big concern that folks have about reapportionment, about redistricting. Mm -hmm. Is it going to make mean that there are going to be fewer uh, African Americans, free, f fewer Latinos? And, and we don't think that it will, but these, these lines are shifting, and it is a reality. But the fact that, the, the fact is that our legislature is certainly the most diverse, ethnically diverse uh, in the history, probably, of any legislature in the state, or rather in the country. And I think that says a lot about California and about the, uh, the fact that we're working together. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, me, let me follow up on that with a kind of a comment and a question. Um, you know, and for, for people in uh, political science who look at, say, they get all of the data of how did every single of the 180 uh, rep state representatives in California vote on all the 1,000 things that came across your committee or your desk in that two-year session. Um, and they sort them out by whether you're a woman, black, Latino, et cetera. And they find that there are, that there are patterns. And I think you, you know, alluded to that, that it does influence your outlook. And these are very, you know, traditionally established uh, findings across state and time um, that there are some differences. And that's why we, it's important to have this descriptive representation. Yet at the same time, um, when uh, a Latino was in charge of the redistricting commission in 2001, 2002, um, we saw that on that issue, when there were many, many chances and many Latino organizations brought lawsuits against that redistricting plan because there could have been many, potentially more seats, how, how is that something that you plan to address or see? At, at what point does your party take over or does your party force you maybe uh, to retreat from your sort of ethnic or racial uh, sort of uh, representation of your district and say, well, we need to fall in line and do what the party yeah, you're a Democrat first. tells us to, so let's, let's yeah. vote and, on this and that, bill. And that's a, uh, that's a good question. Uh, certainly, um, um, as caucuses, there's an African-American caucus, there's a Latino caucus. We certainly try to work together whenever we can uh, and to be sensitive to that fact. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, no one, uh, certainly in the leadership uh, uh, of the party, Democratic Party, wants uh, to... Um, uh, preside over a, uh, a reduction, a diminution of African American seats or Latino seats, for that matter. So that is kind of a kind of a delicate balance that that, that occurs, uh, you know. But the fact is, demographics are changing, and so uh, you know the, the the reality is that uh, you know an African American may only have this seat for another two or three cycles. You know, ten years from now, it may be a solidly Latino district. As well uh, as maybe some white seats. As well as some white seats, as well as some other areas. Uh, you know, I mean, the demographics are just changing. And uh, that's what's so dynamic, exciting about this process. The, the challenge is to maintain that diversity, to encourage it, uh, and to make that possible in, in ways that can, in conformity with the law, because there are some certain laws that have to be complied with. Right. Federal voting rights, civil rights legislation is in place that will takes precedent over, you know, the, the, the state just sort of moving the lines around where it wants to. Right. So, uh, you know, we're all sensitive to the need to comply with, with federal laws, you know, but there are political realities that we, uh, that we have to face as well. And that's why working together, being collaborative um, is, is very important so that, uh, you know, you're not at cross ends. Okay. Hey, well, we want to thank the assembly member. He's, uh, you know. He's in the uh, Democratic majority in the state assembly, the most powerful state legislative body in the, in the, in the country, a hundred billion dollar budget or, or more than that, and he represents Loyola Marymount University amongst other insignificant areas, but most, this is the center of the universe <laughs> right. right here, right here. Thank you once again. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, let me see if I got one in my bag. I think I do. I'll go, I'll go up and grab one. Uh,